And I don't know if you remember that, that bill, but um, would to God that there would be that kind of a hunger mm -hmm. in America for God's word mm -hmm. and a reception for God's word. We'll open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Ruth, chapter 1. We are continuing the study in Ruth, and this will be the second uh, time we are in, in this book. And I'd like to read verse 6 through verse 18. Ruth chapter 1, beginning at verse 6. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return into the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters, why would you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughter, go your way, for I am too old to have an husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have an husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would you tarry for them until they were grown? Would you stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughter, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and they wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. Two weeks ago, we considered verses 1 through verse 6 under the title of Beginnings. We saw how this story started. And today, the second message under the title of Demarcation. Before we come to the message itself, let's spend a few moments with an introduction and a review. The book of Ruth is many things. It's a love story to be sure, but it is more than just a love story. We will see the providence of God, and that providence will not be an isolated occurrence or event that pops up here and there, but you'll see that God's providence is stitched through the entire book. God has a plan. God sovereignly works in our lives, and they're not isolated cases here and there, but we'll see that they're all tied together. The book of Ruth is about tragedy lostness, poverty, redemption. We'll read about gleaning and, and handfuls of purpose and the Leverite marriage, all provisions in God's law, which is holy, just, and good. Provisions that God will use in the lives of Naomi and Ruth. 
Grace. Grace in this book. This book provides a window into what practical love is all about. When we get to chapter 3, husbands, we'll look at what it means to be a husband with a Christ-like love, as Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, loved his wife. He loved her so much that if it meant somebody else would be your husband, and that was God's plan for her, he would acquiesce his will, deny himself for his wife, because he loved her. And as we mentioned last time, much of the gospel is here. We're going to see that, that Boaz is a picture of Christ. He's a type of Christ. He's the, the Goel, the kinsman redeemer. Very quickly, we saw things, six things last time. We saw that this book occurs during the time of the judges. And right away, we understood it was a very precarious, difficult time in which this story unfolds. It was a time of spiritual lukewarmness. It was a time when everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes. And so we have relativism. Situational ethics, we have idolatry, anarchy, we have social ills, civil unrest, economic problems, everyone doing what was right in their own eyes. Secondly, we saw Elimelech sojourning and dwelling in this place. Elimelech did not trust God to provide, so he left. Boaz stayed, others stayed. Elimelech took his family and put them in harm's way. And the Bible very carefully uses the word sojourn. Elimelech thought it was a temporary, a temporary trip, but it turned out to be permanent. Thirdly, we saw Naomi mourning. God saw fit to remove from this earthly scene by death both Elimelech, and her two sons-in-law, Malon, excuse me, her two sons, Malon and Kilion. And we ask the question, what should we make of that scene? It's easy to have hard thoughts towards God in our fallen nature. It's easy to question God. But we saw from a different vantage point God would do whatever he needed to do to get Ruth back to Bethlehem, gleaning into the fields of Boaz. God would do whatever he must do to get you, my believing friend, to close with Christ and to be a recipient of grace. Fourthly, we saw God working. In those first six verses, God was not idle. God was working to will and to do of his good pleasure, and to get glory for himself. Fifthly, we saw God's blessing. Naomi heard all the way in the country of Moab that God had visited his people back in Bethlehem with a bountiful harvest. And again, we looked at this from a spiritual vantage point. It's not simply that God was providing food for his people, which he was doing. Food for Naomi, so she could fill her belly. It was such of a bountiful harvest, there would be gleanings. There would be handfuls of purpose. And again, God was getting Ruth by his sovereign will into that field to gather those gleanings so that Boaz could see her. But then lastly, we saw Naomi determining. Scripture says she arose to go back. She was steadfastly minded as Ruth was to go back to Bethlehem. This afternoon, now we're going to proceed on. And if you look at your bulletin, we have actually four headings under the title of demarcation. We're going to look at Naomi's discouragement, 
and I don't mean discouragement as an adjective to describe Naomi, I mean it as a verb. She was discouraging her two daughters-in-law. Secondly, we'll look at Orpah's defection, and then listed in your bulletin is Ruth's devotion. And I was looking, as I was looking at the message last night, I realized we don't have enough time today to look at that last section. We'll look at that next week, but we'll mention a few things about Ruth's devotion. So again, the title of the message this afternoon is Demarcation. If Naomi's journey is anything at all, it is a spiritual journey. It is a spiritual journey. The decisions that she would make, what she would do in her life, in the final analysis What it does to her spiritually is what is important. What you do in your life, where you will live, what job you will work, who your prospective husband or wife might be, whatever the spiritual result of that is, that is the reality, that is the truth. Naomi is making a spiritual trip. The trip from Bethlehem to Moab was backsliding. The trip now from Moab back to Bethlehem is repentance. It's returning. As I think you know, that's the same Hebrew word. Returning is the same word as repentance. She's on this spiritual journey. And Orpah And Ruth have a spiritual journey to make. You have a spiritual journey to make throughout your life. Naomi's journey is one of repentance. Orpah's and Ruth's journey is one of conversion. And this journey brings them to a point of demarcation. A crossroad. They come to this point where most commentators believe they actually come to the borderline between Moab and God's land. They're at the Jordan River, the point with Israel on one side, Moab on the other side. Jehovah, God in his temple on one side, the God, lowercase g, Chemosh, on the other side, the God of the Moabites. God's covenant people on one side of the river, the Moabites on the other side of the river, those who were under the curse of God, those who were not allowed to go into the temple for ten generations. And they come to this demarcation, this boundary, this dividing line, and it's a gospel demarcation. Naomi comes, Ruth comes, Orpah comes with at least 10 years of a sad, tragic history with them. And here on one side they could see God's promised land, the land of the Israelites, that place where they left. On the other side behind them they see Moab. And they are at this place of demarcation, the valley of decision, the pinch point, the place where the question is asked, all in, go time, whatever you want to call it, this is the place now where the rest of their life is going to hinge upon a place of demarcation. And if you know the book of Ruth, this is the very hinge, the very turning point of the entire book. Because Ruth makes the right decision, we read the entire rest of the book is an unfolding of God's blessing and grace upon Ruth and Naomi. And because Orpah makes the wrong decision, 
we never hear about her again. Let's come to Naomi's discouragement. Naomi's discouragement. And again, I'm treating this word discouragement as a verb, not as an adjective. She was discouraged. Remember, she said, my name is Mara. I am bitter. But I want to look at her discouraging of her daughters-in-law, which you will have to admit with me is very strange. When you consider where Naomi has come from, the decision that she has now made to return, and yet her daughter's in law, she says, don't come. She discourages them. And this is very, to me, very incongruent. The two do not seem to go together. Think about Naomi with me for a few minutes. I wanted to develop just a little bit about her character because, because she is in a backslidden condition, I think we can understand a little bit about the mind of a backslider. If we backslide, if we become lukewarm, how we think and how we react, it's, it's a tremendous Contrast: Naomi deciding for the Lord, but then putting up a stop sign for her daughters in law. Naomi. Naomi like the prodigal son. Naomi came to her senses and understood that she needed to be back, absolutely back with God's people. She had been a wanderer. If you've ever wandered from the Lord, you know in retrospect, it is so sad, so miserable, so regrettable, so difficult, sorrow. We know that there's no rest in Moab, spiritually speaking. It's, it's a painful day. It's a regrettable day, the day we go to Moab. And it's God in his mercy who wakes up the wanderer. God, by his providence, by his word, by his Holy Spirit, the influences of God's Holy Spirit, things that intersect our life. It's the mercy of God who plants that inward call or brings that providence into our life to come back, to return if we have been there, or to come for the first time by way of conversion if we are not saved. It's the work of God. Naomi was dwelling in Moab, and if God permitted, she would die there in that foreign land. She would stay there if God did not arrest, arouse. And so God sends his awakening providences, the death of her husband afflictions and losses and crosses are multiplied. Her little nuclear family back then was broken up. Her soul is sorrowful. She becomes bitter. She thinks God is against her, even though we know God is for her. She thought, along with Elimelech, that she was escaping the famine and she found a worse famine in Moab, a famine for hearing the word of God, a famine of a family of God, brethren, who were all marching to Zion together and would encourage and would help one another. There are many good things we could say about Naomi, though, even in her backslidden condition. She was not perfect, obviously, she complains against Jehovah God, but remember the psalmists often did that. They argued with God, they complained. But she never left God. She continues to use his covenant name, Jehovah God. It seems like she retained her allegiance to the true and living God in the midst of this 
this culture, this society that was so idolatrous and so pagan. She acknowledged God in the midst of adversity. Her religion was no mere surface thing. Even though she was out of the way, the seed of God remained in her. Have you ever known Christians who could not stand the test of affliction or trial or difficulty and they're found to be not the real deal? I do not watch a lot of television. One program I watch occasionally is Antique Roadshow. It's a show where antiques are evaluated. First of all, they're examined to make sure they're the real deal, and then they're evaluated. Their pedigree is looked at. And to know if an antique, whether it's a, a, a painting or a, or, a, or a piece of cabinetry or jewelry, whatever it might be, Certain details have to be verified about that antique. It could be 100 years old, 150 years old. And sometimes, upon close examination, a fraud is discovered. Many, many things about a piece could be, appear to be authentic. But upon close examination, the expert realized it's either counterfeited or somebody tried to repair it with non-antique parts, or they ruined it by whitewashing it or painting it. Under the microscope, something that potentially could be worth $50,000 is worth $5 and could be sold at a garage sale. Is your Christianity the real deal? If God inspected it under the microscope to look for those little ownership marks that he engraved or stamped within your soul. Naomi underwent this test and though on many fronts she did fail, the seed of God was there. She was a believer, and she would return to God as, as, as painful and as sorrowful as she would be. We need to think about our life under God's examination microscope. When we are in the crucible of affliction and trial, where do we turn? To whom do we run? We can go to Moab. That's the mistake that... Elimelech and Naomi made. But now at least Naomi is returning. But this discouragement that she had, that she is now sharing with her daughters-in-law, she is discouraging them from coming back with her to the Lord. Verse 8, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. Verse 9, The Lord bless you as you go. They say, no, we will go with you. Verse 11 through verse 13, Naomi says, I cannot help you. I cannot provide a husband for you. I think that's what you need, a husband. I'm too old to get married and have kids for which you would tarry and wait and you could marry them. She's thinking a very, in a very carnal, human nature way. Turn again, my daughters. I cannot help you. It grieves me that the Lord's hand has gone out against me, and that's affecting you. And then, of course, Orpah departs. And again, she says, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. You go also. Here at the Valley of Decision, this point of demarcation that will separate one from the other, Naomi resolved to go into back to God. 
and yet tells her daughter's-in-law, don't come with me. I think there's at least two reasons why she does this. The first one is simply this. Naomi mistakenly believes that Orpah's and Ruth's well-being is dependent upon her. She's looking to her provision instead of God's provision. She's trusting in the arm of the flesh, not trusting in the arm of God. You see, when we backslide, when we become lukewarm, when we stray from the Lord, our thinking is not right. She is a backslider, someone who has been away from the covenant community, away from God's worship at the, in the temple. And she says, I can't help you. I think you need a husband, I think, but I cannot help you. She is essentially confessing her inability to do for them what she thinks they need. And of course, the irony is for Ruth, Naomi cannot provide a husband for her. So I guess the next best thing is God provides a husband for her. The perfect husband. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Who do we trust? Even when we are at the low point of backsliding or lukewarmness, do we trust in the arm of man, man's devices, or do we trust fully and finally in God himself? Do you remember that verse that says, the heart is deceitful above all else and desperately wicked, who can know it? Do you remember that verse? The verse right above that says, Cursed is the man that trusts in man, that makes flesh his arm, whose heart departs from the Lord. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. The heart is deceitful above all things. The context of that is we have a tendency, because of the deceitfulness of our heart, to not trust the Lord, but to trust man, to, to trust our works, to trust what we can do. Backsliding condition affects our thinking. Naomi mistakenly thinks she has to provide. She has to have some works, some methods, so they can all return. And we could ask Naomi, do you despise the riches of the goodness and forbearance and long-suffering of God, knowing the goodness of God leadeth to repentance? It's not in a man. But the second reason I think, and I think this is more getting to the crux of the matter, and I think when she's saying these words, it's similar to Caiaphas, who, who was prophesying about it was expedient for one man to die rather than the whole nation become in trouble. Remember, Caiaphas did not know what he was saying. I think what she is saying, not knowing what she is saying, is she is saying, count the cost is why we read Luke 14. Count the cost of discipleship. Jesus did this. Remember the Samaritan woman came to him. She basically said, I want to join myself to the Lord. And Jesus told her, I haven't come for you. I've come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. To her credit, she didn't just go away. She pressed the issue. And she was, God had her count the cost. At this valley of decision, so often people are urged to make a quick decision. Decide. What, what Naomi is doing here is have her think through what does it mean to cross that river Jordan to go into God's land and to forsake your gods, your people, your culture, everything that you've ever known, your personal history, and to basically 
render yourself unto God for God to do for God do with you what he wants to do. Naomi was a true believer. Naomi knew she had fallen. She knew what she had lost. For Naomi, no cost was too great for her to get back. And we may look at her and say, she was a terrible soul winner. Why, why didn't she just drag him in with her? <laughs> drag across the River Jordan. The issue is, it's a very serious thing to be reconciled to God, understanding there has to be a separation from Moab, a separation from the world. You cannot serve God and mammon. And Orpah, for some portion of time, we'll look at shortly, as she went along, she might have seen some value, some benefit in being counted among the Lord's people. But when she got to the point where she realized she would have to forsake her world and her life, she could not do it. She ran until her excitement ran out. She ran until adversity came in. Think about what Naomi is telling her daughters-in-law. She offers them no prosperity gospel. As a matter of fact, as a very poor person, a widow in poverty to go back on their alone, there's no visible benefit to that. No worldly gain to be gotten. All she could offer was you need to have faith in Jehovah God and trust him. And so, as we share the gospel, we have to be careful to understand that there is a cost that people need to be reminded of. You're going to build this tower? Do you have enough to build it? You're going to go to war? Well, 1,000 against 2,000, do you have enough? Counting the cost implies not making a hasty decision. Counting the cost reminds us of the seriousness and the far-reaching aspects of the gospel. We don't take God with us and put him in our pocket and we go on our merry way living our life. He wants our all. He wants our life. Again, no man liveth unto himself and no man dieth unto himself. Whether he lives, he lives unto the Lord. Whether he dies, he dies unto the Lord. Whether he lives or dies, therefore, he is the Lord. Naomi's discouragement. She discouraged her daughters-in-law because, number one, her thinking wasn't very clear. She was backslidden. She was erroneously thinking she had to supply for her daughters-in-law. But secondly, I think, getting to the crux of the issue, perhaps speaking, not understanding what she was saying, it was a count-the-cost moment at that line of demarcation. Next, let's look at Orpah's defection in verse 14 and verse 15. The scripture says, They, all of them, weeping and wailing, they lifted up their voice and they wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And then we read those words, And she said, that as Naomi said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back to her people, and to her gods. Orpah is defecting. Orpah is abandoning. Orpah decides to not go along. She is abandoning Naomi. She is abandoning Ruth. She is abandoning an opportunity to live among God's people in the promised land. She is abandoning a relationship with the covenant-keeping God. She is abandoning hope. She is abandoning hope. She starts well, but she does not end well. If you've heard it one time, you've heard our pastor say a thousand times, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. 
Notice how she starts well in verse 10. They said unto her, plural, both Ruth and, and, and uh, Orpah, they said, we will return with thee to thy people. She had good intentions. She made a, a confession with her mouth, an audible confession. But now, as we see her going back, we realize she is not ending well. Do you remember the parable of the seeds, the four grounds, and the seed is sown on the ground? It's sown by the wayside, the rocky soil, among thorns, and the good soil. The seed sown upon the rocky soil, the scripture says, they receive the word with joy. And for a while, they believe. The seed sown among the thorns, in Luke it says, they bring forth no fruit to maturity. They bring forth fruit, so there's buds and flowers and fruit, but the fruit is not to perfection, King James says. It's the word maturity. Whether Orpah was rocky soil, whether she was thorny soil, she starts well, but the end result is the same. She defects, she follows no more. She goes back, she separates herself back to her people and to her God. Even though she had gone on the way and confessed an affinity with Naomi and Ruth. Notice that she weeps. In other words, there is an emotional component to her temporary decision. That emotional component would tend us to think that her heart was engaged a little bit. Emotion is good. Religion without emotion is cold and lifeless. Think about the emotions that we have relative to God. We love God. That's an emotion. We have joy in the Holy Ghost. We have blessedness. We have godly sorrow. Sorrow is an emotion. Emotions are good, but emotions are not faith. Emotions are good, but emotions are not faith. There was an Old Testament patriarch, Abram, who was in a very similar situation to, to Orpah. God called Abram to leave Ur of the Chaldees, his people, that land of idolatry, very similar to Orpah, and he says, Abram, I want you to go out to a place, and I'm not going to tell you where that is. Go into a land that you know nothing about, and you don't know where it is. And the Bible says, by emotions, Abraham went out. Wrong version. Not the King James. <laughs> by faith, Abram went out. I'm sure he had emotions. I mean, I would be thinking, I would be a little bit unsteady, unsure perhaps, a um, little bit of trepidation. I'm sure my, my wife is nagging me. You know, where are we going? And why are we going where we don't know where we're going? But in the final analysis, by faith, Abram went out. Orpah, What's it going to profit you if you gain all of Moab and lose your own soul? You must by faith follow after to know the Lord. Faith not in Naomi. Naomi is, she's, she's stumbling over herself and her words and she's saying some things that are wrong. Orpah and Ruth were called to have faith not in Naomi, not in Naomi's plan, although it's a good plan at this point. Have faith in Jehovah God. She had tears, she had emotions. I think some of those tears were self-pity. 
because she had a very difficult decision to make on the back of a very difficult life. I think she had tears for the realization that her gods were being torn from her and her culture and her life and everything she knew, everything she was comfortable in, her homeland. But there, in the Valley of Decision, at go time, this place of demarcation, this dividing line, she kisses Naomi, her mother-in-law, and goes back. And I think she realized for her the price tag was too much. She did not want to pay the ultimate price of her entire life being committed to the, to the God of the universe. And I will admit with Orpa, it's, it's a hard choice. It is a difficult choice. Jesus asked the disciples this very same hard choice. Things were getting difficult. There were hard sayings from our Lord. There was uneasiness in the synagogue. There was murmuring. There was unbelief. And he turns to his disciples and says, Will ye also go away? Apostles, disciples, it's go time. It's a pinch point. It's the valley of decision. Will you also go away? Peter reveals that this hard choice is no choice at all because he says, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Peter was able to see everything from the vantage point of eternal life, eternal blessedness and joy in the Lord. And for that instant, Peter said something that was so crystal clear basically saying it's not a choice at all. The world or Christ. And as I said, the rest of the book unfolds God's grace and blessing to Naomi and Ruth. And we never hear again of Orpah who goes back. It's tragic. It's very sad. Well, as I mentioned, we're not going to look in the last place um, at Ruth's devotion. I want to spend more time on it, but let me just highlight a couple things about this and think about these throughout the week. Again, verse 16 and verse 17, Ruth says, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God will be my God. Where thou diest, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. We perhaps have heard this statement of Deep love, devotional love in the context of a wedding. <laughs> but this is the love of a daughter-in-law to a mother-in-law. But ultimately, it's a gospel declaration of love and commitment to Jehovah God. In chapter 2, Boaz recognizes this Ruth out in the field, and through a series of events, he, he, he speaks with her, and he understands where she has come from, what she believes in. And Boaz says to her, The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. He recognized she trusted in Jehovah God, under whose wings thou art come 
to trust. This statement of verse 16 and verse 17 has seven gospel elements in it. We'll look at those seven gospel elements. This statement is a reflection of what God told Moses in Exodus chapter 6. This statement involves self-surrender. It involves sacrifice. Her devotion, unlike Orpah's defection, is by God's grace a choosing of life. At that point of demarcation, as Orpah goes back into the world, into Moab, at that point of demarcation, she believes and goes forward. God, speaking through Moses, said in Deuteronomy, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave, same word as Ruth says, cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. God says, set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. And then God just doesn't stop there. He says, choose life. Choose life. Ruth chooses life by God's infinite grace and as they say the rest is history blessed history wonderful history so we'll look at that next week that gospel confession and declaration of Ruth but as we close ask yourself if you had to align yourself this afternoon with one of those three women, Naomi, in a backslidden condition, but returning, coming to her senses, or Ruth, who is choosing life, deciding for Christ, or Orpah, who says the cost is too great. Can't pay the cost. I'm going to go back into the world. Of those three, who would you align yourself to? Maybe, maybe none of them. Maybe you're you're already back in the land of of Israel, uh, helping with the harvest. And praise the Lord if that's true. But I trust God's word has come to each one of us with that element of. Truth and power as God's Holy Spirit speaks to us in grafting his word into our heart and into our mind. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this story of Ruth that has already begun to unfold with so much gospel intrigue and, and, and so many things happening simultaneously. But we see all of it under your hand of providence under your hand of, of, of your kind and, and, and good and perfect will. We pray, O oh God, that you would, would mix these words with faith. We ask, O oh God, that you would write them upon our heart and upon our mind. That, Father, as today we consider this portion in the weeks ahead as we, we go through this entire book, that you would speak to us though this occurred many, many years ago, that it would be relevant to us today, 
and we would find joy and blessing in thy word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.